I'll be reading from Daniel chapter 9. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and to all the people of the land. Now, therefore, O God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy. And for your own sake, O Lord, make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. O my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present, present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O oh my God, because of your city and your people are called by your name. The word of the Lord. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent, according to thy promises, declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant us absolution and remission of all our sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, beginning in the seventh chapter at the seventh verse. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? A reading from chapter 6, beginning at the fifth verse. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. 
The word of the Lord. I invite everyone to take a look at the thanksgivings and prayer requests found in the back of your order of worship as we pray in silence as a Beeson community. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you please join me in prayer through the litany in the order of worship. O God the Father, creator of heaven and earth, have mercy upon us. O God the Son, redeemer of the world, O God the Holy Ghost, sanctifier of the faithful, O holy, blessed, and glorious Trinity, one God. From all inordinate and sinful affections, and from all the deceits of the world, the flesh, and the devil. In all time of our tribulation, in all time of our prosperity, in the hour hour of death, in the day of judgment that it may please thee to give us a heart to love and fear thee, and diligently to live after thy commandments. We beseech thee to give us, good Lord. That it may please thee to give to all thy people increase of grace, to hear meekly thy word, and to receive it with pure affection, and to bring forth the fruit of the Spirit. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord. That it may please thee to strengthen such to stand, and to comfort and help the weak-hearted, and to raise up those who fall, and finally, to beat down Satan under our feet. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord, that it may please thee to preserve all who travel by land, by water, or by air, all women in childbirth, all sick persons, and young children, and to show thy pity upon all prisoners and captives, and to defend and provide for the fatherless children and widows, and all who are desolate and oppressed. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord, that it may please thee to forgive our enemies, persecutors, and slanderers, and to turn their hearts. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord, that it may please thee to give us true repentance, to forgive us all our sins, negligences, and ignorances and to endue us with the grace of thy Holy Spirit to amend our lives according to thy holy word. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord. O Lamb of God, who takest away the sins of the world, grant us thy peace. O Lamb of God, who takest away the sins of the world. Please stand. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. He the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Will you pray with me? Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I think I would be right in saying that everybody in this room is convinced that prayer is indispensable uh, for the spiritual life. I think everybody here would agree that um, the greatest things that are accomplished in the history of the faith have been accomplished through faith expressed through prayer, and that prayer has proven to be most effectual in the life of the believers. I would think that everybody here would agree that the Bible from beginning to end does not suggest but commands that we pray. It is not a choice. It is our life. And I think we would agree too that when we do pray and pray earnestly in difficult times that it is then that we experience true freedom. Uh, freedom from trying to fix it ourselves, freedom from the ways of the world, and complete surrender to the Lord. I think we would all say that. But praying is another matter. When I was growing up, we used to sing, as perhaps some of you had, a sweet hour of prayer. Beautiful song. But as I grew in my faith and tried to cultivate a prayer life, I could muster about three minutes, not an hour, and without a lot of repeating. And it didn't always seem to me the most uh, glorious time of my Christian experience. How do you account for the fact that in the spiritual life, the one area that we seem to bomb the most is prayer. You see, I think when Satan fogs, he's very strategic. He knows where to fog. Satan doesn't mind if you and I study the Bible and learn a lot of theology. Just don't pray. Because without prayer, that knowledge will lead to pride, and he loves that. Satan doesn't mind if you preach scintillating sermons and great lessons. Just don't pray. Because Satan knows it is probably more important to talk to God about the people that you're ministering to than just to try to talk to the people about God. And Satan doesn't mind if you're very active, a real activist in the life of the church. Because he knows you'll be too busy to pray. And you'll be so inwoven in your programs and your efforts that you'll hardly think to pray. And don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we don't pray. But we don't pray in the sense that we recognize that our need is total, not partial. We don't usually make prayer the top priority of our daily activities. In some cases, I must confess, I have felt it's kind of like singing the national anthem at a game. That's how you start, but let's get it over with and get on with the game. And what happened to prayer meetings in the life of the church? We do want to cultivate a life of prayer, but if you're like me too often, you're too busy. And, um, and maybe if you're clever, you can rationalize it that, well, the Lord knows what he's going to do anyway, so, you know, what is my prayer going to contribute? God has ordained the means to the end, and the means is prayer. And he expects us to pray. I will say to you that if prayer is commonplace and not too significant, there will be times in your life where it will be absolutely crucial. We hope not too many. They are devastating. 
But there will come times, crises, events, circumstances, where you have no alternative but to pray. All your theological knowledge, which is great, will take a back seat. All your exegesis will take a back seat because you'll be in a situation either because of health or safety or finances or moral crisis, whatever it happens to be, and all that you will be able to do is cry out to God and say, help me, I can't help myself. Heal me, I can't heal myself. Deliver me, I have no protection without you. No time for the elaborate prayers that we uh, get under control in all of our services. It's kind of, like, kind of like Peter when he's walking on the water. There's no time for, O thou who inhabitest the universe. It's uh, simply, Lord, save me. And that's the desperate moment. The way to prepare for those, those times that are going to be difficult and troubling, where you face death in the family, where you face crisis in health, where you face financial reversal, whatever it happens to be, is to cultivate a life of prayer, properly cultivating a life of prayer leading up to that. The Psalms and the prophets tell us, seek the Lord while he may be found, so that when the troubles come, the waters will not wash you away. Very poetic. I mean, God can always be found. But I think that statement is, is not necessarily the best way to translate it. Seek the Lord in the time of finding him. When is the time of finding him? The Spirit of God begins to move in your heart to pray, and that's when you can pray earnestly and have access and comfort and help. I want to turn your attention for a few moments to Psalm 130 because it is just such a case where an individual was in great crisis. But something has been added to this crisis that we need to keep in the back of our mind as well. It's one thing to say there's going to be a crisis in health and finances and whatever else it happens to be. But if that crisis is caused by our sin, now we've added a new dimension to the prayer. And that is how to deal with guilty fears that will be part of the need. You may not have been there yet. The chances are you will be. And there's no recourse except prayer. This little psalm, very short, straight to the point, easy to follow. It's made up of four stanzas, two verses each. In the first two stanzas, the psalmist is addressing God. And in the second section, he's addressing the congregation. The first section is his petition. It's not just an ordinary petition. This is a desperate cry for help from a major crisis in his life. It's not national as far as we know. He's not talking about the nation losing a war or anything. It's him. He is the one who is in need. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive Let my, to my cry for mercy. Very short, out of the depths. The psalmist didn't sense the need to give God the details of the crisis or to give us the details because depths or other times flood or other times the cistern, whatever, they all represent a deep valley, a gorge, a crevice, a place where he's gotten into and he cannot get himself out. And you can interpret the depths for whatever you're going through in your life. It's those deep places, much like you read in Psalm 23, where the shadow of death hovers over you. You can't get out. You can't solve your own problems. It's a crisis. And so he is crying out of the depths to the Lord. 
because he has nowhere else he can turn. And he wants the Lord to hear his voice. You may know from your studies of the Bible that the verb to hear isn't just listen. It means to respond, to deliver, to, to do something. Hear my prayer means to answer the prayer, to come to my assistance. So he's urging God here um, with an imperative. And then with a bold figure, let your ears be attentive. It's a very unusual expression. Usually it's just one ear. Here it's two ears. But the idea of let your ear, it's almost like, Lord, bend over and listen closely to what I'm saying. It may be going by you somewhere. Let your ears be attentive, meaning responsive, not just paying attention. He's desperate when he's repeating over and over again what he wants God to do. But what he wants God to do is to answer his supplication. And supplication is always an appeal for mercy. He is in a situation, and this little line forms the transition to the next section, where what he's praying for, he knows he doesn't deserve. He's got himself into some difficulty, and we'll see by sin. He has no way out to appeal to God, and he's going to appeal to God on the basis of a cry for mercy. He needs that mercy, he needs that attention, he needs that care, or he will not survive. The prayer is just that urgent, and it's just that serious. This is not an ordinary daily prayer request. This is a crisis for him. The second section, he expresses his confidence. On surface, if you just read through this psalm and weren't studying it, you might say, well... These verses are disconnected. But since it is a composition and it flows together, you have to see the connections that are there. In the second section, his confidence is that he knows God forgives sins. And from his prayer for mercy, the supplications, we can easily see in the connection that some sinfulness in his life has caused the crisis that he's in. If God delivers him from the crisis, it's going to involve removing the sin. They will go together. So he says, If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Uh, the idea is if God marked down in a book all of your sins, and they stayed there. He kept the record. And come judgment day, open the book and see what you've done in all of your life. This is hypothetical. Lord, if you kept such a record, then the rhetorical question makes it very clear. No one would survive the judgment. Who can stand means who can stay standing in the judgment. The whole book of Psalms starts that way when Psalm 1 says the wicked will not stand in the day of judgment. They'll be destroyed. And so here his statement is no one would survive divine judgment if you kept the records and judged us according to our deeds. That's his first part of his confidence. The second one is with you there is forgiveness in order that you may be feared. This is the good news of the Bible. Nothing else matters if there isn't forgiveness. Um, but because there is forgiveness, statement of fact, there is forgiveness. He's bold to pray for help. He's bold to ask for forgiveness. He knows that the Lord will forgive his sins. There is forgiveness with you. It's a very beautiful word, very practical word. In modern Hebrew and Israel, the word slika means, excuse me, <laughs> pardon me. And we use the same kind of language in our own culture. There is forgiveness. This word is used in Leviticus all the time for when you bring in the sacrifice, confess your sin, the priest will declare the forgiveness of sins. This is a fact of the Bible. Now, the Israelite, 
did not know how God was going to settle the matter. He did not know how the sin was going to be paid for eventually because he comes back every few weeks and goes through the same thing again. But he did know one thing very clearly, that he was forgiven because God said so. He could rely upon the Word of God. And that's what he is hoping to hear again when he comes in, repents, makes his confession of sin, knowing with confidence what God said, that if you repent and if you confess your sin, there's forgiveness. That's the glory. Now, we living in the New Covenant, we should even be more confident because we know who paid for the sins and we have the Holy Spirit as the pledge of our salvation. We've got a lot more, but the fundamental principle of the faith has not changed. There's forgiveness. God is a forgiving God. And let's not minimize the meaning of this word forgiveness. I've run into a lot of people who would say, well, I confess my sin and I was forgiven. Now, what, what, what is God going to do to me to make me pay for it? That's not forgiveness. <laughs> it comes closer to purgatory, but it's not forgiveness. If God forgives, if you truly repent and confess your sin and God forgives you, which we know from the Scriptures He does, He will never, in this life or the life to come, bring it up again. Some of your friends might, but God won't uh, because He's forgiven you. And He has the ability to forgive and to remove it from your account. But there's a purpose for this forgiveness in order that God might be feared. The forgiveness takes away the fear of judgment. There's no wrath, there's no condemnation, you're forgiven. But it leads to the reverential fear of the Lord. It kind of reminds me of Hezekiah after he prays and is forgiven and is restored to his health. He says, from now on, <laughs> I'm going to walk softly and I'm going to praise God every day of my life because he knows that God has forgiven him, restored him for a purpose. In order that you might be feared means the reverential adoration which leads to obedience. That's why Jesus made it clear you don't have to fear the person can hurt the body. It's the one who has control over the soul. You fear the Lord. And if you are forgiven and it's been removed, and you walk with the Lord in, in the joy of having been forgiven, the response to that is reverential, obedient worship of the Lord. And that's the purpose that God has in forgiving. So it's part of the spiritual growth. You are in a crisis, you pray, the prayer is going to lead to a deliverance which will involve forgiveness of sins, now you're going to renew your commitment to living the life of the Lord, what He has revealed, and that is going to be your reverential worship. So there's a whole sequence of events here. The third stanza is a little different. It's his expectation. His confidence is there's forgiveness of sins, his expectation is to be told that God forgives sins. He says, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. He's waiting. He's hoping the waiting is the endurance. The hoping is the motivation that helps him to wait. And both words are not casual actions. Both of them include in their usage, their meaning, tension. It's not that he's filled with anxiety because he's a devout believer, but there's, there's a tension until it's resolved. There's 
He's not resting. He's not able to sit back and, and, and just say, it'll happen, it's automatic. No, he's, he's not completely at rest. He's a little tense, waiting, waiting and hoping. And that calls for patience. It calls for a desire. What you're waiting and hoping for calls for commitment. What he's waiting for is the word. Now, you have to treat that within the context of this psalm. He's waiting for the word, an oracle of forgiveness. As with David, Nathan could say to him very clearly, God has put away your sin. Or the prophet would say to the people who have suffered in the war, comfort, comfort my people. Your sins are forgiven. The war is over. It's these words that came to the people. And in the Israelite sanctuary, they would come from the priest. That the worshiper would come in, confess, repent, bring the sacrifice. And it was up to the priest to discern and to declare, God has put away your sin. You're forgiven. They knew God forgave sins. They wanted to hear it. They wanted a word from the Lord that would tell them that. Now, you and I, living in the New Covenant, don't need to hear it. We have it written that if we confess, the word of the Lord is you're forgiven. Nevertheless, there will be times in your life when you are praying for forgiveness and you're racked with guilty fears and you would like a counselor or a minister there somewhere just to remind you what God says about forgiveness. Because you don't think straight when you're confessing and you're in a mix that doesn't seem to be with any way out. Someone to remind you. God said, His word is true to you. There's forgiveness. That if you confess your sin, He's faithful. He will forgive you. And you can walk away knowing you're forgiven and not be filled with fear of what God might do to you as a result of that. I think you can make a good case in this psalm that the watchmen are probably the priests. Uh, priests who are on duty in the sanctuary. What would they be watching for? Well, what do watchmen watch for? <laughs> the morning. They get watching for the morning. Uh, I don't know if you've ever had a job as a night watchman. Terrible job, but if you have one. Uh, what you do there is uh, just bide your time until the sun comes up and you're relieved. Why would the priests be watching earnestly for the morning? Because it's their duty. As soon as there's that first little ray of light coming all over the mountains in the east, it's time for the morning sacrifice. Now they can make the sacrifice at the altar. It's on schedule. It's what their duty is. But he's waiting for it more than they. They're doing it to discharge a duty. He needs it. And so his waiting is more than the watchman waiting for the morning because he wants this all to be settled, to hear this word from the Lord that you are forgiven and go your way and sin no more, that kind of a statement. There is forgiveness. The fourth section is encouragement. See, he's now still speaking to the congregation. Um, o Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is abundant redemption. Don't trust anybody else. Don't trust yourself to work out the details. Put all of your hope, all of your trust, all of your expectation in the Lord. Why? Because there's that faithful covenant love that he has for you. He's not going to let you down. But you need to get yourself right with him. And there is plentiful redemption. There's more than you could ever draw on for sanctification, forgiveness, because that unbounding love is always there. And then he adds... He himself will redeem Israel from all 
its iniquities. He's moved from his experience and his hope and his expectation of hearing the word to instructing the congregation. Keep your hope in the Lord for two reasons. One, his love and his abundant redemption. That's the nature of our God. But more importantly for that, there is coming a time where he will remove all the iniquities from his people. No other religion in the world can make that claim. There's coming a time when all the iniquities will be removed. That's the hope that he is telling them to wait for. Someday, sometime, sin will be no more, suffering will be no more, exile will be no more. God is going to redeem his people from all their iniquities and what all those iniquities cause. Because that's total and abundant redemption. Let me put it this way, if you want something to think about a little bit. Every time that you confess sin and are forgiven, that should be in your mind a harbinger, a foretaste of the time when you will never confess sin again. Every forgiveness of sin is a preview of the time when the sin will be completely removed and you won't have to confess sin. Every time you pray for healing and if there's partial healing, complete healing, even improvement, every one of those situations should trigger in your thinking there's coming a time when the healing will be complete. We'll no longer have to ask for healing because the Lord is going to remove all the sicknesses and the infirmities. Every time you pray and there's an answer to prayer, sometime in the future, those prayers will be completely fulfilled. And as Jesus said, you'll not ask anymore because you will be there. You'll be there in glory. You'll be there in this new creation. So that our faith is not just trying to get through the day. What happens in our spiritual life through the day is based upon the revealed nature and word of God, but it's a foretaste of the deliverance and the healing and the forgiveness that will come finally once and for all. That's why he's telling the Israelites, hope in the Lord. No future in any other religion. No future in any other prospect. We have the hope of glory. We have the great day of redemption. We have the complete deliverance, which is yet to come. I think if we keep our focus on the forgiveness, the healing, the deliverance from this fallen world and from the life of the curse, our faith will be strengthened in confidence when we pray for the things along the way. That on the journey to that intended end, there are crises, there are difficulties, and God is fully able to deliver from them. Even if we cause them ourselves, he can forgive, he can deliver. It's what he delights to do. And therefore, I think one of the most important things for us to do as our spiritual life requires it, is to cultivate a life of prayer. I don't mean just saying a prayer. I don't just mean a word of prayer, a quick one. Or, but in our own spiritual times of devotion, deep prayers acknowledging that our need is total, not partial, that we are not sufficient for the ministry, that we are instruments in a clay pot, and we need desperately the Lord to do it through us. And in his grace, he chooses to use us. But we give him the praise and the glory, because without him, it will not happen.
A life of prayer probably is the most important thing we can cultivate in ministry, in our spiritual lives, in our families, and in our personal walk with the Lord. But it will take time. It will take time in the Word. And it will take encouragement from one another to cultivate such a life. Knowing full well that He answers prayer, that there's forgiveness of sin from Him, and that His plan is to lead us to glory. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.